Well, welcome everyone uh, to this session on investment facilitation for development and especially how this new agreement can lead to sustainable development by growing inclusive and sustainable FDI. My name is Matthew Stevenson. I'm the head of investment and services at the World Economic Forum and we're very proud and grateful today to be co-organizing this session together with the permanent mission of Chile and WTO and with the International Trade Center. And uh, I just want to acknowledge the heavy lift that our colleagues at the ITC, especially on Sao uh, and online, uh, have done to get us here. And I also want to thank the IASD uh, for the opportunity to be here and the Great Trade and Sustainability Hub. So this session could not be more timely, and you'll soon find out why. Uh, just 48 hours ago, the IFP agreement was presented uh, by ministers to the WTO and um, it is subject to active negotiation now for its incorporation in the WTO rulebook. We hope for a breakthrough in the next 48 hours. The IFP agreement includes 126 and counting members, which is over three quarters of the WTO membership. And of those 126, 90 are developing members. And so it couldn't come at a better time for us to understand what is in the agreement, what comes next, and especially how it can lead to sustainable development. And so to talk about these issues, we have a great panel today. Um, we will be joined soon by the Minister uh, of Ecuador, Production, Foreign Trade, Investment, and Fisheries. Uh, but we understand her schedule, you know, whenever she comes in, we'll give her the floor. Uh, but we're very grateful that Ambassador Sofia Boza is here with us. Um, Ambassador and Permanent Representative of Chile to the WTO and co-coordinator of the uh, IFT process at the WTO. Chile has been coordinating the process for a few years now, so there's no better person to give us the, the inside scoop. <laughs> uh, we also have Dr. Axel Berger, um, the director, uh, Deputy Director Interim at the German Institute for Development and Sustainability, known as IDOS. And uh, IDOS has been doing amazing work on the analytical side of the IFP agreement with their investment facilitation index yes. and uh, their studies on the development benefits that can come from the IFP agreement. And Axel has fresh data to share. It's only five days old, so it's very exciting. And he has some slides for us. Then we have Esipion, uh, Oridiera Gomez, the director uh, for the Division of Enterprises Competitiveness um, and institutions at the ITC, and we've been working closely with the ITC on this topic for a number of years now. We're very grateful for that partnership, and uh, we're very grateful for what SCPM has to say, especially in the area of technical assistance, capacity building, and how to implement the agreement. Uh, given that he has his heart uh, in this, you know, he really wants to make a difference, I know, from our conversations together. So with that, I think uh, we'll have two rounds of questions. The first will be about the agreement per se, like what is in it, why does it matter? And the second round will be about implementation, what comes next, where do we go? And I'd like to acknowledge uh, we have Carlo Petinato from the EU and we have Christian Tichas from GIZ and we really want to integrate them in the conversation. They both you know, have important insights to share. But after these two quick rounds of questions, uh, where about each speaker has about four minutes, plus or minus, we want to get as many questions in as possible. It's much more fun when we have Q&A. So if any speaker goes too long, I'm going to put my hand up like this, <laughs> you know, just so they know. You can all see uh, together that, uh, that they wrap up that particular episode. So with that, Ambassador Boza, thank you again for taking time. We're dying to know what you can share with us <laughs> in terms of um, where things stand. Um, and yours. Well, first of all, thank you very much, uh, Matthew, for, for inviting us to co-host this uh, this session at uh, this uh, Trade and Sustainability Hub of the IAC, uh, and, and thank you very much to you all for being attending this session. I know that we all have a very busy schedule. There are many things going on at the same time, so I'm, I'm really glad to have you all here. Well, what is going on right now? Many things, but <laughs> in the last hours, well, as you know, after three years of negotiations, in November 2023, 
we finalized the negotiations of the IFT agreement, Investment Facilitation for Development Agreement. This is a plurilateral agreement that has been negotiated in the World Trade Organization. And we wanted to take the opportunity that the Ministerial Conference gave to us to present this agreement with the support of our ministers, of our authorities, and that meaning that uh, they are recognizing and endorsing the finalization of the negotiations. So last Sunday, as, as Matthew just said, we had a huge event with more than 400 people participating from the uh, 120 plus countries that we have uh, in this initiative. And there, our ministers endorsed a declaration in which they recognize, as I said, the finalization of the negotiations of the agreement. They uh, uh, present the agreement in its three versions, Spanish, English, French, not only to the WTO, but to the public. The agreement is right now public to anyone that wants to consult it, that wants to know more about it. It's completely public, which I think is a very relevant step as for us, it's very important also the engagement of the academia, of the private sector, of course, and uh, the agreement was made public also through that joint ministerial declaration. And also, uh, our ministers presented a, a request for the legal incorporation of this agreement under the Annex 4 of uh, the Marrakech Agreement. As you know, the, the Annex 4 of the Marrakech Agreement means as a plurilateral agreement of the World Trade Organization. The World Trade Organization already has plurilateral agreements as government procurement, although all of them were born at the same time as the organization itself. So this would be the first time in which a standalone agreement will be, would be incorporated to the WTO legal architecture after the, uh, the, the Marrakech Agreement itself, after uh, 1995. So that's something that, that it's, it's very relevant for the organization, I think. And we are very much motivated because we think the agreement has a value, especially when we can implement it. And there, I have to recognize all the assistance, all, all the support of the ITC and of other international organizations that have already started a, a pilot projects to help countries to uh, assess their needs to implement this agreement. I think uh, Minister uh, Sonsoles can talk to you more about that. But the agreement, the value of the agreement, it is implementation, but to implement, we need it into the WTO legal architecture, and that's why we are now in, in this new stage in which we are requesting for that legal incorporation and that discussion is, is, is going on. So that's where we are right now, my dear Matthew. Super. Thank you, Ambassador. And thank you again for your time with us today. Axel, we're dying to know what you found out in terms of what, how this agreement can be useful if implemented. Well, thank you very much, uh, Matthew, but also ITC and uh, the, the mission of, of Chile to, to bring us together um, to, to reflect on this agreement, to reflect on, on its benefits. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm happy to present uh, results, research results conducted um, as, a, as part of, of our uh, research at IDOS, uh, conducted by my colleague Soyana Oleksayuk and at Balistrari. So, um, I'm playing the typical um, odd academic and have some slides for you. <laughs> um, so let's start with this one. Um, as, you, as many of you probably know, uh, our empirical research is based of, uh, on, on our investment facilitation index, um, an index that we've um, uh, built at the Institute, uh, which we've updated also with the help of the WTO Secretariat. Um, and it uh, quantifies of what countries are doing at, at country level. It includes 101 investment facilitation measures. So just to give you a, an idea, the, the IFD agreement covers more or less 50 or 60 percent uh, of these measures. So our index goes beyond, on, uh, beyond the IFD agreement. 
Um, and it measures that for 142 WTO members. For the other members, the data was not accessible for us. The data is public. You can access it um, on Synodo, which is a data sharing platform. I'm happy to provide the link uh, afterwards. So what this chart displays is the current level of adoption. So what countries are actually doing at the moment in, uh, in terms of implementing investment facilitation uh, measures. And uh, what you can see is on, 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 the, left, on the left side, um, many developing and least developed countries are, are located and so their, their level of adoption is pretty, pretty low, um, uh, slightly above for the, for the countries on the left, uh, slightly above uh, 0 0.2 of an index of a maximum of 2. So um, now in addition to the gray bars, um, you can see the red and, uh, and orange bars which illustrates um, the reform gaps um, yeah, relative to the IFD agreement text. And so what we did, we, um, we, um, we focused on the pure, the binding provisions, shell, shell provisions. Then we also um, uh, focused on the conditional binding provisions, shall to the extent practical, shall encourage, shall endeavor. Um, and then we also looked at the, um, yeah, Best endeavor, um, best endeavor provisions, which is the, the light light orange bar. So we, we've got a pretty good picture using our index on uh, on the current level of adoption, but also how, what countries would have to implement if they are uh, part of the of the agreement. And so the the, the main message here is the reform pressure um, for for developing and least developed countries is higher. Of course, um, that's not a surprise. But at, at the same time, this also means that the benefits of the IFD agreement for these countries, for developing countries, is also higher. And uh, that leads me to, to the next slide. Uh, and this, um, this yeah, visualizes um, the, the, the re latest results from my colleagues. Computable general equilibrium simulations, or CGE modeling for short, uh, and this shows uh, the potential benefits uh, that these are sizable. Um, so this is uh, this is the simulation for welfare and GDP for uh, almost 100 countries, and um, where we assume a reduction of FDI barriers for three scenarios. First of all, um, an IFD only the binding provisions of the IFD agreement. That's um, that's the uh, that the red bar of of the last chart. Then full implementation of conditional provisions, that's the second scenario. The third scenario combines binding and conditional provisions. And the fourth scenario combines binding, conditional, and best endeavor provisions. And then we've got a fifth, a very positive scenario uh, where we have additional members. Uh, we've simulated only the results if, if India and the US would become part of the agreement, which then obviously also enhances the results. So to save, thi save time, I would like to emphasize three important conclusions from our research. Um, the benefits are highest for low and middle income countries. Among the, the low and middle income countries, especially African countries, would benefit um, the most because they, at the moment, have the biggest reform barriers, uh, obviously. Uh, second, um, the benefits for all regions increase when more countries join the agreement. Uh, we've, as I said, we've illustrated that by including India and the US. It, by the way, India, uh, a country like India, would benefit from some spillovers. But if India would become a, a part of the agreement, its benefits would be um, 2.5 times higher. So there are significant, significant uh, benefits also. Um, and third, obviously, um, the, uh, the, the higher the coverage, larger the benefits. So uh, countries benefit, um, um, would benefit the most if they um, are able to implement not only the binding, but also the conditional and best endeavor uh, provisions in the agreement. And um, that's where I would like to end. But uh, I know there's a second question where I would really uh, like to highlight that countries need support in order to really benefit from this agreement. Thank you, Axel. And, and let me congratulate IDOS for the amazing work in this space. We really need numbers to, to make good policy. I'm going to put you on the spot for a second. Mm -hmm. um, 
I know, I know you've been doing this work for a few years, and I understand over time you may have reached um, more uh, better insights or more granular insights or more... Uh, uh, is there any progression? I, I understand maybe the estimates of the benefits went up over time. Is, do you have any comment on, on that over time as you got to know this topic better? Um, I wouldn't say that the benefits increased, but our understanding of um, the level of granular granularity is, has increased, right? So um, because we we were able to um, um, to simulate the different components of the IFD agreement, right? The, the binding, the conditional, the, the best endeavor provisions, and and what kind of effects they would have on uh, on members. And what really, um, yeah, what really came out of this this research is that. Um, if countries are able uh, to, to implement the, the um, agreement in a comprehensive way, they would obviously benefit the most. But that's also, um, I guess, the challenge. I guess we will discuss it when we come to the uh, question of, of uh, needs assessments and technical assistance support. Thanks, Axel. So, so now we have the hard data, we have the numbers, and I'd like to turn to a Sipion. Um, I'm so sorry. I was laughing. Minister, you're in the right place. Thank you. I'm so sorry. Let's give you a minute to settle in. Yes. Okay. Because I was going to put you on the spot right away. No. No, I won't do that. <laughs> so what, what happened, just to catch you up, is um, we had uh, Ambassador Bosa give us a little bit of the state of play at the IFD. We have Axel from uh, the German Development and Sustainability Institute give a little bit of the numbers on the development benefits. And I'm going to ask Essie Pion, director of the ITC, uh, to share a little bit about how this agreement can actually help with sustainable development. And thank you very much, Matthew. It's an honor to be here today with friends and partners, with the World Economic Forum, with intelligent people like Axel, <laughs> uh, with the countries that we serve, Ecuador, Chile. With our partners, the UK, the EU, and Germany, uh, which will work a lot. But for me, investment and trade has to do with trust. And this agreement seeks to build a trust, seeks to build transparency, uh, seeks to build inclusiveness. Uh, I think that, and, and efficiency. It is a way towards creating that trust really by streamlining procedures that countries will have, exchanging best practices, hopefully towards single windows in a very relatively short term, and in a way really to help con uh, investors to feel comfortable. For me, is this agreement, as the ambassador would, I suppose, uh, agree with is a step towards the right direction. And I know there was a lot of debate at, at WTO uh, but the fact that so many countries, you said 126 already mm -hmm. signed and have committed to this, to working together, to facilitating transparency, efficiency, and streamlining is, is really something that will help sustainable development. Uh, I hope that it will allow what you were saying, really allow ITC and also GI is here with us today, is to support the countries to implement it in a way that is really uh, Cohesive. In a past lifetime, I used to promote investment in, in the whole Caribbean region. We were 19 countries working together, and that's why we went to Chile. Mm. And that was quite interesting, because when we went to Chile, the minister from the, that time couldn't understand that he was sitting in a table with 19 countries seeking to promote investment together, because he thought we were all competitors. And the thing that we tried to explain to them, we're not competing against each other. We're looking for commonwealth of the Caribbean region as a whole. That included Anglophone countries, Francophone countries, Dutch countries, well, Curaçao is an, uh, part of the Netherlands. And the idea that we said is similar to what this agreement wants to have. We have to be transparent. I hope that we do not engage in fights uh, in a region we prevented out of trying to sell each time uh, the bar lower and lower that will not be, really bring prosperity, exchange of best practices, and what the WTO was created for. Really have trade benefit all. <coughs> uh, ITC has, be, uh, has been working for six years already. Today is a, you know, this year's our, uh, anniversary. And our executive director is really committed towards bringing wealth. I think that, that uh, 
uh, our logo is Trade Impact for Good, and I hope, I hope also that we can say investment impact for good. Not all investment is good, but this agreement should lead towards a, a more humane world trading system, hopefully, better investments, and at the end, what we all want is sustainable development and be able to accomplish the SDGs. Uh, ITC is ready to support, but that is the next question. But before I finish, I want to, to thank Chuan, because basically how ITC works is that some people like me are the pretty faces, and Chuan <laughs> is the intelligent guy that works and does the work. So I wanted to thank him very much. And I say pretty faces because I still want to believe that I have between two pretty faces, so <laughs> you know, it should be a little bit prettier. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chuan. I, I like how you renamed uh, Trade for Good to Trade Investment Impact for Good. Um, and I think the responsible business conduct and other uh, provisions on sustainable investment and anti-corruption uh, will create those, that bar of, of good practice that will allow for this investment to you know, be a good, good type of investment, uh, quality investment, as the OECD would say. Um, so. Minister, Your Excellency, thank you so much for joining us. We know how busy your schedule is. Uh, it must be crazy. Um, Minister Maria Sontoles Garcia, uh, Minister of Production, Foreign Trade, Investment and Fisheries of Ecuador. Yes. Ecuador yes. has played a leadership role, yes. uh, especially in the implementation phase of the IFD agreement. We'd love to hear a little bit about your experience and why you joined the IFD agreement, what you think it can bring, and uh, what has been Ecuador's journey. Yes. Minister. Thank you so much. I'm so sorry for being so late. I was lost with my team. We really don't know how to um, handle all the meetings and all the places we have to be. Um, we prepared a speech and I would like to read it to all of you. Um, for me, it's a great honor to be here and uh, with all this committed audience today representing Ecuador in a double capacity. First, as a, one of the signatories of the Joint Declaration on the Agreement on Investment Facilitation for Development, and secondly, as one of the first countries to apply the self-assessment guide to determine the levels of commitment they could assume under this initiative. This is why, in the first instance, I would like to refer to the IFD uh, agreement. The successful completion of this initiative is, without a doubt, one of the most encouraging news about the relevance of the work of this organization. The World Trade Organization has been crucial in expanding global trade flows in the last 30 years, but at the same time, it, is ha it, it has been limited in advancing a trade negotiation agenda, which, let us say clearly, has significantly affected the advancement of the legitimate objectives of the developing countries. Thus, now having a new agreement regarding a key aspect to support our countries, such an investment facilitation for development. It is a milestone that we cannot fail to highlight at the level it deserves. Ecuador is a country that always believed, supported, and now signed the text um, of the joint declaration that officially gave birth to it. This is why this is an occasion of undisputed satisfaction for us. My country's support for this initiative was not a decision taken lightly. Through rigor rigorous analysis, we concluded that the IF IFD agreement complements national investment promotion efforts, serving as a crucial element in improving our investment environment. From the beginning, the initiative emphasized maintaining development as its cornerstone, aligning with Ecuador's vision of inclusive and sustainable growth, to contribute to poverty alleviation and job creation, among other key national objectives. In this line, I would like to highlight the importance of Section 6 of the IFP Agreement, which introduces innovative provisions on sustainable development, including responsible business conduct and anti-corruption measures. These provisions, which mark a historic moment as the first of their kind within the WTO, framework put respect of, for human rights, working conditions, and environmental protection at the forefront. These elements are not simply compliance checkboxes, but catalysts for responsible business practice that contribute to the broader social good. The, object, the objective is to move from focusing attention on business transfer for exclusively economic purposes. 
to promoting and consolidating associations that without abandoning the commercial objective, contribute to the sustainable development of the host country. Regarding the implementation of the self-assessment -assess guide, I would like to convey that it was a success, largely thanks to the excellent preparation of it by the General Secretary of the WTO, the collaboration of the institutions such as the ITC and the Inter-American Development Bank, and the joint work that we were able to carry out from the Ministry of Production, Foreign Trade Investment and Fisheries and the Permanent Mission of Ecuador to the WTO. At this point, I would like to thank all the institutions involved in the development of the Needs Assessment Guide, which allow us to carry out our work and culminate this important exercise with a successful outcome. Although the IFD agreement has its main reference, uh, the agreement on trade facilitation, in the case of the former coordination for the development of the matrix of national commitments is much more demanding. This is because in the case of the TFA, the coordination was carried out primarily with the customs authorities, while in the case of the IFD agreement, it has had to be coordinated in the case of Ecuador with around 30 different institutions, some sort of dense of national in order to have all the necessary inputs to complex the matrix. This lead to at least four plenary meeting, meetings being held at the national level between the months of June and October of 2023 in order to explain the nature of the process of filling out this commitment matrix, the context that should be complete, completed by each institution, the times that should be complied within, and above all, the advance in the compilation of the information necessary to complete the self-assessment exercise. This allows us to arrive with the defined contact points in each of the institutions with well-developed information for the development of the National Self-Assessment Workshop, which was developed, by, um, was developed between October 30 and November 1st of 2023, and which had the value participation of the WTO Secretariat, the, I, the IDB, and the ITC. This workshop was carried out with complete success, both due to the level of particip participation of the competent national institutions, which, as I indicated previously, were around 30, and due to the ease of monitoring provided by the self-assessment guide. The final result is that Ecuador currently has its matrix of commitment perfectly defined, known and validated by all the competent national institutions which will follow it to begin applying the IFD agreement from the first day it comes into force. This remarkable exercise has allowed us to complete the work, but it also left us with several lessons, which we believe could be useful for other countries that still have to go through this same work. In the interest of time, I will only mention three main um, ones. The first is that investment management is excessively segmented in many of our countries, which does not allow for a climate of investment attraction that favors the work of companies seeking to establish themselves in our territory. This is why it is urgent to advance initiatives such as the establishment of single investment windows in order to simplify the management of the FDI flows. The second is that it is crucial to align investment attraction policies with the sustainable development objectives of our countries. Progressively, the term investment must be more closely linked to the better labor and environmental conditions in its implication. That is, we have the increase to the weight of the win-win part of the investment formula in the management of our policy. The third is that the challenges of developing countries cannot be solved without broad and sustained support from foreign direct investment. In current terms, it is impossible to think of having sustained results in the fight against poverty, insecurity, or climate change if we do not have a sustained flow of foreign investment to our countries. All the work carried out so far is just the beginning of the journey. Now we have a new tool to manage the attraction of investment. What remains for us is to start e use, using it to ensure that investment are increasingly a means for the development of our, of our countries. 
For this, we know that we have the support of institutions such as the WTO, ITC, and other organizations that have taken on the challenge of participating <coughs> in this implementation. The road is still long and complex. We start from the recognition that without a considerable increase in long-term foreign direct investment, it will be impossible for us to face the challenge that the contemporary world has imposed on us. All of us who are participating in this initiative have decided to develop it precisely to enhance the role of investment in development. It, it is equally up to us, to all of us, to generate the action so that we can promise becomes our next reality. Thank you so much. Thank you, Minister, for having developed you know, such a thorough um, lessons learned for us today, uh, which we took careful note. I really like your word, use of the word, a, this is a new tool. Yeah. I think that's what it is. It's a political tool, a technical tool uh, to make progress. Axel, could you please bring back the mix? Um, so now, I think we'd like to just briefly make a few quick comments on the implementation, building on the Minister's experience sharing of the three lessons with the needs assessment. Um, you know, this is all about capacity building and, and, and needs assessment. So, where is Ecuador? Yes, is Ecuador here? Basically, basically, what we need to do is we need to go from from here to here, right? And so we need technical assistance and capacity building to do that. And I'm going to ask Ambassador Bosa to first give us a, few, a comment on the kind, the kind of technical assistance that is included in the agreement. Well, one of the sections of the agreement is, is uh, dedicated to special and differential treatment. And uh, there we use a methodology which is quite similar to what you can find in the uh, trade facilitation agreement. In the sense that uh, countries, especially developing and least developed countries, will analyze the different provisions in the agreement and categorize them according to the uh, how to say very simple how easy or difficult they see they can uh, they, they can fulfill those requirements or those provisions so that's what uh, minister Garcia uh, mentioned as the needs assessment that uh, Ecuador has already uh, done through a pilot project uh, supported by the by the ITC and uh, in that sense, that allows developing an LDCs to have clarity where they need technical assistance and capacity building to, uh, to be able to implement the different provisions in the agreement. So that's something that is also in the agreement that after uh, this needs assessment and after the categorization of the different provisions, by the developing an LDC participants, they have different uh, time frames and different uh, um, and different requirements to uh, uh, fulfill the, the the provisions. And in some cases, it is uh, it is um, intended that technical assistance and capacity building will be put in place to help them to uh, have the resources to implement those, those provisions. So this is a very relevant part of our agreement because, as I said before, the agreement itself, of course, is extremely relevant. This is the first uh, international agreement at this level that, uh, that addresses investment. But finally, the quality of this agreement will be determined by the quality of the implementation. So that's why we have, as I said, a whole section that now you can uh, you can consult in in WTO website and you can access because the agreement right now is public. And there we want to be sure that um, that um, developing countries so this is analyzed provision by provision, see where they are to fulfill those provisions and in case that they need, they can access to technical assistance and capacity building to fulfill the provisions. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you, Ambassador. So with that technical assistance and capacity building, each economy could go from the gray, where it currently is, 
to, a, to the colored part, essentially, but it needs that, that boost. Uh, which is why I asked Axel if he would bring it. So it gives us a visual, mm -hmm. a visual cue of what we're, why, why, why we need it. Um, Matthew, if I can uh, add, yeah, yes, uh, considering that we, we have, I'm an economist, so I enjoy very much <laughs> having that in the, but there is, here there is a correlation because those countries that, that gap that they are signaling is uh, higher are those countries that will benefit more from the implementation of the agreement. Yes. So that's, that's something very, very relevant. Yeah. And many, many less developed countries are, are there stand to the mm -hmm. most. So I'm looking at the clock and um, I know we have some very interesting comments from the floor, but I think we have some very interesting comments on experiences from pilots. Mm -hmm. So could I ask each of you gentlemen to be very brief, like two, two to three minutes, mm -hmm. two minutes, just Read your lessons, learn, and then we'll get to some questions. Mm -hmm. So, uh, first, um, Axel. Age before beauty is normal. We did three pilots. What did you learn <laughs> on implementation? All right. So, we do not only like to crunch numbers. We also like to understand how uh, international agreements work in practice. So, um, so what we did in uh, 2022, um, we, uh, we conducted some pilot needs assessments uh, in three countries, in, in Lao PDR, in Zambia and in Togo. So we um, selected uh, three, three LDCs where we assume there are big, uh, big gaps in terms of implementation. And um, so we, we did not assess the whole IFD agreement, it was, was still in negotiation. We, we looked at a selected number of rather more or less stable provisions. Um, and we were interested in, uh, in, in understanding, um, yeah, to what extent is it already implemented or which, which provisions are covered? What are the barriers for implementation we can, uh, we can expect? And so what we found is that these three countries, on average, uh, already implemented uh, two-thirds of, of the provisions that we looked at, as I said, a selected number of provisions, partially, so implemented partially, and one-third was not, not implemented at all. Uh, and none of the provisions we looked at were fully implemented, so yeah, quite some homework there. Um, so what were the barriers for implementation? And I'm a, I'm a bit, uh, I'm speeding up, we have a paper on that, I'm happy to share it. What were the barriers? And, and I think that's, that's most relevant for our discussion here. Obviously, um, the use of ICT, right? Digitalization and automa uh, automation tools are a key barrier um, that, that we heard. Furthermore, procedures uh, have been insufficient. And I think that the main point I'd like to mention are institutional barriers. So uh, a lack of cooperation and coordination among governmental agencies and stakeholders. So what we did also in these workshops, and this very much reflects what, uh, what the minister said, we brought together a, a large group of, of stakeholders. Many governmental institutions are affected by investment facilitation. You have to bring them together, but also a number of uh, um, yeah, uh, non-governmental um, stakeholders, business associations, and so on. And in fact, it was often the first time that they sat together and reflect jointly on, uh, on the nature of their investment frameworks. So uh, that was very important and I think also there the, the real benefit of the IFD agreement lies, to bring actors together to reflect on the, on the reform of their investment facilitation frameworks. Perfect. Esipion, what are your thoughts about implementation? Yes, I, I would like to say that the agreement does something that I really like, is that allows each country to follow it as a space and adapts to the legal framework of each country, which is something coming from the developing world that I like, is really what I've been always trying to say about even uh, new trade rules related to environment and, and labor is the carrot, not the stick. So I'm really happy with that. I think that uh, one of the, the things that I, that I do know that is very much needed for our countries to be able to do correct policies, data. Data or where the investment going, how is it going, and that is something that is missing a lot. ITC is working, well, as you know, ITC has um, very uh, good public goods. Those public goods uh, in trade are excellent because we, we have really a, like a mirror close, we can so see on the source 
and also the destiny of the, of the trade, but in investment it's a little bit more complex. So this is something that we need to work with the countries to be able to build that data. I think that the first thing that, 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 that we can offer, and we work with our partners like say, the European Union, the UK, Germany, and others, the United States as well, is, is to do the needs assessment like we have done in many countries, and also benchmarking. We have benchmarking tools that will allow you to compare yourself to similar countries. What are they doing? How are they doing? The exchange of best practices and a lot of training. After the benchmarking, we try to do specific training on your needs. <laughs> something that I think is also something that, that we can really bring as is needed is what was mentioned, I believe, by uh, all of the people, the, the Her Excellencies <laughs> and Accent, is the need to dialogue. I think we need to have a public private sector dialogue on how these things can be implemented. Uh, and I think one of the strengths of the international development community is sitting down in the same table, the public sector and the private sector. Not necessarily the private sector that has already access, because some private sector has very direct access, but those little SMEs, uh, group them in, in clusters or associations is something we do a lot as well, working with chambers of commerce, export associations, and producers associations to be able to have that dialogue and how the investment could go and to tailor, because I, I think that is the correct word. How can we tailor the needs of this agreement and of a sustainable investment into each country rather than an imposition? So ITC uh, has those tools. We are working with partners again uh, and uh, also, we, we hope to work with other UN agencies, with WTO, uh, with WEF definitely, in which we are part of, uh, maybe to, uh, we're working with WEF in what we call WIDA, the World in, uh, Investment uh, International uh, in Development Alliance. And the own Alliance, where we all sit together to, in, to try to promote sustainable development, the sustainable investment and trade. Because for me, ITC is specialized in helping trade promotion organizations, but also investment promotion agencies is the other side of the cone. You cannot see investment without trade or trade without investment. So sorry, I always speak too long. That's all right. I stop. Perfect. <laughs> so now comes the most fun part. So uh, please, everybody think uh, of questions. But I know Christian Pichas and Carlo Pecinato, please take the floor first. But we'll take as many questions, comments. We want to hear from as many people as possible. So uh, please, turn. Yeah. I, can, I can go first, with yeah. pleasure, thank you. Um, Axel, is it deliberate that the German Institute does not evaluate Germany? I mean. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's there, but we only have, you know, uh, 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 we named only every second country. So uh, Germany is somewhere hidden, all right, all right, but it's uh, there, I, I, I promise. Know, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, 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 yeah. Axel, we're sure, we're sure, we're sure. <laughs> Jokes apart, no, uh, I, I appreciate a lot this, this index. I think it's extremely useful. Um, from the point of view of somebody who has negotiated this from the beginning, it's, it's really, really a useful tool. It's not just for us to explain it, but, but for everyone uh, who's interested in this. Now, of course, the sentence, uh, uh, the, the, the bigger the gap, it means greater reforms are needed and therefore greater gains, it could scare perhaps somebody. But that's why this flexibility uh, is inbuilt. So that's the difference with many other agreements in the, in, in, in the WTO. It is each country decides how long it assesses where they are there, and then they say, I need this many years, or uh, immediately, and I need this capacity building, or not. So that, that is, I think, what differentiates this model from the trade facilitation agreement. And another typical thing of the WTO that happens in agreements, and it, it doesn't happen here, is you know, everybody wants longer transitions, or least developed countries, the longer transitions, the, uh, the, 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 the better. In this case, we are quite relaxed about this, because everybody has an interest in implementation, because the sooner they implement, the bigger the gains and the sooner the gains. So we are quite happy with this flexible instrument because everybody wants investment. Uh, that, that, that's, what they, uh, that's what happens. And it's exactly that. It's a carrot. It's not the stick. If you don't do it, we'll punish you. No, it's, everybody has an interest in doing this to attract more investment. And I think 
the experience from Ecuador, I remember when I was in Geneva uh, and speaking with, uh, with your colleague uh, who was there, who was telling us really the experience of the self-assessment, the needs assessment, which was quite telling and, and saying, you know, there are agencies that no, don't always talk to each other and that exercise really brought together everybody who's involved in investment. So in itself, even the self-assessment is uh, has value. And I finish with the elephant in the room. Uh, uh, this is a great tool, potentially, potentially can, can produce gains, but it needs to be incorporated. Will it be incorporated in the WTO? Because um, that, that, that is simply the question. I, I mean. Thank you, Carlo. Carlo being the lead negotiator on investment for the EU, just for everyone to, to know. And I think that goes directly to the idea that Christian wanted to put on the table, uh, our colleague from GIZ. Thank you, Matthew. And uh, first of all, congratulations to Ambassador Boza for having so successfully facilitated. <laughs> My question relates to the needs assessments, and we have heard two examples of pilots or pilot needs assessments. And it would seem that the needs assessments are really a threshold issue because they serve to assess the implementation capacity. And if I understand it correctly, implementation capacity determines uh, under which categories countries will categorize their, the provisions, their commitments. Mm -hmm. Now, irrespective of whether or not the agreement will now at this ministerial conference or at the next <laughs> or some later point be incorporated into the WTO rulebook, I would think that needs assessments should already start as soon as possible because it will help developing countries to prepare for the future implementation of that agreement. Is there any coordinated process for these needs assessments? And I'm not speaking of an individual needs assessment, but rather how can developing countries access support to conduct needs assessments? Is there already an idea out there how this can be done in a coordinated session? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. I think that's an excellent uh, question. But let me, uh, uh, and whomever wants to uh, jump in, please welcome. Let me just go around the room to give a chance for everyone else if there's any other question or comment. Um, I'll look at everyone. This gentleman and that gentleman, please. May they say who they are? Yes. Yeah, please, uh, uh, Jan Hoffman from Anktat. Fantastic. Uh, with a lot of experience with very similar exercise with the trade Station Agreement, where we actually did undertake these self-assessments during the process. Uh, I wanted to share one, one thought here. We, we all agree, yes, we, we wanted. Why, why should we wait? Why should uh, I'm the developing country? Of course, I'm in favor. During the, it's, I'm talking about 20 years ago, when the negotiations on trade stations started, uh, it was actually Lu, Lucas Saronche from Tanzania who made this very nice comparison. I said, he said, um, by telling me as a country, if you don't have the capacity, you're not obliged to implement it, it's like telling me, okay, if you don't have the money to send your daughter to a good school, you don't have to send her to a good school. <laughs> but I actually want to send her to the school. I, I want this implementation. In that sense, this special differential treatment, uh, uh, I think, well, success always has many parents, uh, but at Ankhtar, we, we help developing this. Uh, we are quite happy that some of this was drafted with many Latin American countries, actually, or delegates from, from Chile, from Ecuador, very active at, at that time. Um, so to, to make sure that, <coughs> yes, the beauty of the WTO is that in the end there should be some obligation. Yeah? But at the same time, the special development treatment allows for doing these self assessments. I'm fully with the, here, Christian, that we, we want to do this as soon as possible so that the member states, all member states, can, can assess and plan for yeah, doing this gap assessment and then don't, don't wait. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Uh, is part of WED. And we work Absolutely. very closely together. <laughs> and I, I really like your metaphor of we all want to send our, our children to good schools. Mm -hmm. um, that's very, very helpful to keep this grounded. I saw this gentleman. Uh, this is, I am Pravin Jain from India. 
uh, our company is uh, investment company investment banker we do investment in agriculture project and especially for the post harvest preservation of fruits and vegetables our company's reason is that if fruit, fruit fruits and vegetables are most perishable in the world uh, everywhere every country loses 30 to 40% of its fruits and vegetables if we stop that uh, either waste or lost it will uh, reduce the methane in the ozone layer it will be green project for that we are ready to invest anywhere just my question is related with the implementation how idf idf agreement will applicable for that we are going to have the two projects one in nigeria for the banana processing another in uganda for the pineapple processing right and this is more than 50 billion dollars project right so what type of help we can get the ifdf from throughout the world that's fantastic. Huh? Thank goodness we have an investor here in the room asking these, these excellent questions. Yeah, sure. excellent, excellent, question. Sure. excellent question. Actually, in a, in a moment, I'm going to ask all of our panelists to react one by one and also close their, their closing remarks slash reaction. But let me just see if there's any other question or comment. Sir. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm from the University Laval uh, in Quebec and uh, from the University of Bordeaux in France. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. It was very interesting. Um, my question is more focused on the legal perspective. Um, there is a broader TSD in this agreement and technical assistance too, but this is uh, 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 typical provisions that uh, are included that are included, sorry, in WTO agreement. So my question is how and why we should understand these provisions as a new way to promote development in the WTO. Super. Um, I think you've given us really good questions mm. on the needs assessment process, on how this agreement can really help investors in the real world in Nigeria, Uganda, and in agriculture, and the uh, benefits to, to development. I'm going to ask each of our panelists maybe take a, a couple minutes or a minute and a half for your any reactions and your closing thought, please. Um, I'm going to give the minister the very last word. So okay. we're going to go. <laughs> we're going to go. Uh, we're going to go first with Axel Esipion, Ambassador Bosa, and the minister. Axel. Yeah. Um, thank you very much for for this discussion. Uh, it was extremely enlightening, and um, I also perhaps I, I pick up your question: Why is this an agreement that really uh, helps to promote um, development, and why is it different? I mean, I, I think we covered a couple of, of points already. Um, it's really an agreement about, about promoting regulatory reforms, right, at home. Not hoping for a, a tariff concession or whatever by another country. Um, and, and the agreement at the same time provides uh, flexibilities and tools to promote uh, implementation um, at domestic level. Um, and um, what, I, what I very much like um, is... Um, that this bilateral negotiation is driven by developing countries, right? Bilaterals in the past have been promoted by by industrialized countries, and so people are a little bit scared still about bilaterals. But this is really a, um, I would say, a development friendly uh, bilateral, which also provides a blueprint how we can um, design rules and how we can support countries to to comply with these rules. Um, and not wait um, uh, until the dispute settlement uh, proceedings have to be used in order to enforce compliance, right? So that's a new model which I very much support and like, yeah. Super. So scholar to scholar, you answered that gentleman's question. Excellent. <laughs> okay. yes, maybe you can answer this gentleman's question or whichever one. Well, the, the specific on India, that, that's a very uh, specific question. In a very... Okay, okay. the ambassador okay. will handle that. But, but I will say that what the agreement seeks to have, I suppose, like I was saying, is more transparency and having everybody work together. For that, we will need support at the macro level with policy reform. We will need support at the meso level supporting investment promotion institution agencies in the countries. And we will need to support uh, associations of the private sector to allow that dialogue and that assessment. And at the end, also, the work that we do supporting SMEs to be able to capture that investment and benefit from that investment. 
And I think that, that the work that we're doing within WIDA again, and I, I like WIDA because we work with UNCTAD a lot with James Sand and also with uh, the United Nations World Tourism Organization and all together. I would say that what we're seeking is to expand a coalition of the willing to create a better world. And uh, ITC and the leadership of our boss are seeking to do that. And I would I like to end because I, I like I said today, and it's the second time I use it today, I like proverbs and I like African proverbs. There's an African proverb that says, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you go, want to go far, go together. So what we're doing it with this agreement under the leadership of Ambassador and the Minister is going hopefully very far towards a more sustainable future for all of us. So that's my two cents. Thank you, Silvio. Very, very encouraging words. <laughs> well, uh, I, addressing the question about what an investor will find uh, with, with this agreement, well, what, what we have seen, and there, there is a very, very good study that the WEF did time ago, and, and I think that was the main motivation when these conversations about this agreement started, is that it seems that for investors, red tape is something that prevents them to invest in some countries, especially in developing countries, in the sense of where can I find the right information, who I should address when I need information. If I want to make a request in which agency, in which office I should go. So all those uh, uh, administrative uh, issues, information seeking issues that are very often difficult for investors and make them lose a lot of time those are situations that investors find, unfortunately, find more in developing countries and in LDCs. So what we want to achieve with this uh, agreement is, a, is diminishing the gap between uh, developed and developing countries and for investors to make it easier to find the right information, to have streamlined administrative procedures, especially in developing countries and LDCs for them to invest and don't lose don't lose in so much time on that uh, for uh, and that don't be so relevant in the decision because the what they find is a more friendly climate to to invest Super. Super. So when you no subsidy no grants no subsidy no, no it's not about that no, no, no. <laughs> so information on the subsidies more easily because it will be transparent that's right Thank you for your patience, yeah. Minister, no, yeah. Yeah. Um, and especially for being with us. The floor is yours to close the session. Thank you. I have a question for you. Why yeah. you haven't gone to Ecuador to invest? You're an investor. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad that I'm meeting you. You have to come to Ecuador. Um, or Chile. And we're trying right now to, to put on a, a no, single Chile. investment window in order for investors to identify all the licenses and processes you have to go in order to to put the investment in Ecuador, but um, rather than you know answering each question, I, I want to um, for you to get to know a little bit more about Ecuador and what we are doing as policymakers. First of all, 74% of Ecuador exports come from MSMEs, so we put a lot of effort that they can uh, be in clusters and associations in order for them to you know, can be able to comply with huge markets um, such as China. We have an STA with China that we just ratified and um, we provide uh, shrimp for the 60% 60, 60 of China's market. So we are a small country, but we can deliver. So that's one of the things that um, Ecuador has been, uh, 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 I think, leading in the region that um, if you are able to associate small producers, you can really comply with the requirements. Also, 85% um, of what we export um, is for, from what we grow, because we are a very small country. We are only 18 million people. So 80, uh, out of the 100% that we produce, 85% is exported. Um, we are a country that we have oil, gas, minerals, and a lot of agricultural and fisheries. And um, one of the things that this um, investment agreement helped Ecuador do is 
that we do not only focus on how we can attract for an investment, but that they understand that we we really need to have sustainable agriculture. We care for our fisheries and for uh, the sustainable of the oceans. We have the Galapagos. We have the Amazon. We are the lungs of the world. So even though we are one of the providers food for the world, we also um, understand that we have to preserve and care for our own resources. Um, also, I think that for investors, you need legal certainty, you need political stability, and um, I think right now with President Novoa, we have that. And um, we have been fighting against narco-terrorism, um, and, and, and I think that this agreement also allows country to be more transparent. And I think Ecuador has been lacking that transparency. And that's one of the things that was the outcome of this self-assessment, that we realized that we have so many institutions involved because they really want to complicate the investor in other, you know, for the briberies and everything. And right now that we just identify that um, help us to do simpl uh, simplify the processes and um, go ahead with the investors for them to get to know really what's the legal framework that you have to go through Ecuador in order to get your investment ongoing. Um, and also we have the US dollar, so we are very attractive. We are the only country in South America that we have the US dollar as our own currency. So um, we do know that we have challenges ahead and um, putting up a, a single investment window. We are doing that with um, the IDB. Um, and, you know, I think developing countries have a lot of steps to go until we get near to the developed countries. But I think um, this investing, this investing um, agreement will help developing countries to go steps ahead. So that would be my remarks. Thanks. Thank you, Minister. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us today, and hopefully in 48 hours. Hey, can I ask that we clap the, the moderator for a good job? Yes, thank you.